Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, we have a fun panel, center. extreme filmmaking today. Um, I'm Kyle Fraser. I'm the course director for Digital Cinematography One in the DCBS online program um, here at Full Sail. And we have our fun panelists today. And I'm going to kind of let them introduce themselves. And we'll just go one by one. Um, give us a, tell us who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you are now. Um, I'm Tom Boyd, uh, underwater cinematographer. Uh, I went to Full Sail, graduated in 91. Um, always wanted to be working underwater. That's been kind of my passion since I was about that big. Um, I've worked on everything from wildlife documentaries, traveled around the world, been lucky in that regard. Worked on feature films from Crimson Tide, Lucky You, uh, Into the Wild, a bunch of TV shows, Fear Factor, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, Jim Matlos, uh, cinematographer, predominantly commercials, uh, <coughs> specialize in high-speed cinematography, uh, 20 years of experience, visual effects, uh, features, promos, trailers, teasers, uh, you name it. Uh, even worked with Mr. Nyhouse here in IMAX back in the day. Uh, next. All right, um, I'm Ron Ligerloff. Um, these guys are the real working cinematographers. Um, I started my career as an audio engineer, recording engineer, back in the day before there were schools for recording engineers. Um, and I do have a connection to Full Sail. I was part of the team that designed and built the, uh, the re-recording stage, the dub stage here. But I got into uh, diving and photography, still photography mainly, um, and a few years ago, I switched over to shooting um, Red Epic underwater, and uh, I got asked to be here, so thanks a lot. <laughs> I am uh, James Nyhouse. I uh, teach over across the bridge in Final Project, uh, 35 millimeter, as the cinematography and lighting instructor, and I uh, make movies as well. I'm a cinematographer. Uh, one of my first first introductions into the big time filmmaking was for the first IMAX underwater film ever shot uh, well, back in 1970-something, uh, more than I care to remember. Uh, but uh, and it's been a great adventure. Uh, I'm looking forward, and I'd like to congratulate Tom on the oh, Hall yeah, of Fame Tom. induction. Let's give him a big right. round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll, jump, we'll jump right in. So we have uh, some underwater guys, IMAX, uh, high speed. So um, those are all very specific specialties. Um, how did you guys get into those specialties? And what kind of training and where could someone get that kind of training? And whoever wants to go first. Open to anybody. Start with you, Tom. OK. Um, I started underwater. I, I mean, that's what all, all I ever wanted to do. I mean, since I was a little kid, I, that's, uh, I just wanted to be uh, working underwater, and um, so uh, I was in the diving industry, the diving business for a number of years in uh, back east on the east coast, and I just started shooting still images, and um, I realized that that was a pretty competitive market, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll move into, you know, film, and so I took some classes when I was living in New York, I took some classes at NYU, and um, I realized it was gonna, I didn't want to go to school for that long. So I ended up, uh, uh, my brother uh, told me about Full Sail and um, I came here and I liked the practical hands-on. You know, I, I knew all about housing. I can't say, I didn't know all, but I knew a lot about housings and cameras and things like that. And I just wanted to get my hands on the film cameras. And so I started there. And uh, when I graduated from here, I worked for underwater film guy here in Florida, and then eventually I moved out to California and just kind of applied my trade while I was there, doing whatever I could, and, uh, and after a few years, I got the call to uh, shoot the underwater effects for uh, Crimson Tide, and so it's been going ever since, and I've been fortunate enough to shoot you know, film, digital, IMAX, and uh, it's, it's, it's just what I wanted to do. Uh, well, got my start in the film business right after I graduated from college, moved to California, hope and a prayer. Uh, started out in visual effects. 
um, worked for a company for a couple of years and then got laid off and realized that my goal at that point was to learn every camera that was used in the entire business. And along that path, one of those cameras was the high-speed Photosonics film camera, um, which I became one of their uh, sort of a freelance technician. Uh, which enabled me to work with some of the top cinematographers in the world because anytime you're shooting high-speed film, generally speaking, you had a big budget. So I got to mentor and watch a lot of these A-list, big-time DPs work with this film format. And at the same time, when I was on set, it also gave me the ability to just kind of sit there and just observe because I was the specialty guy who would be used for one or two shots. So I got to really watch how a crew worked together, how an A-list cinematographer worked, and I just paid attention and, and really learned as much as I could about the technological side and then the creative side, always shooting still photography on the side and everything. And uh, it was just kind of a coincidence that as I was building a, a reel to shoot cinematography that the phantom cameras started to come out, so I started to get calls to shoot film high speed and then digital high speed. And then I became the go-to guy for a while. And, um, it just kind of rolled into itself, and then, then it became labeled as that guy that does only high speed on that stage doing that thing. And you know, you, you constantly, you're constantly trying to break those rules and break those molds. What most people don't know is I also, in the same year, I shot an animated short film, shooting one frame every couple minutes to shooting 2,500 frames per second at the, at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, for me, it's just... I really want to be one of those well-rounded cinematographers that has, an, has at least an understanding on how it all works. Um, and that's how I got into the high-speed world, and I still uh, do it a lot. There's Visual Effects Society. I wrote, actually, the section on high-speed cinematography in their handbook on how to apply it to normal work. Um, we've all seen it on every commercial you've ever seen on TV. There's probably at least one slow-mo shot now, which is kind of fun. And, uh, you know, ultimately the goal is to continue to round my career and continue to shoot live action and, yeah, shoot dialogue and, you know, blue screen, green screen, visual effects, even stop motion is still a lot of fun. All right. It's easy to get pigeonholed in uh, Hollywood, isn't it? In life, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, I, I'll take a little bit of a different approach here, but, you know, I think from our perspective as underwater photographers, you know, the first thing you have to do is obviously know how to dive and be really proficient at that and, and uh, be able to be safe and, you know, feel comfortable before you start taking a camera down, although I took a camera on my first dive. <laughs> but, um, you know, anybody that really wanted to get into this would really want to be comfortable in the water and um, in virtually any kind of situation. So, I mean, you can be on a shallow dive and get into a down current that's just gonna whip you around and, you know, you've gotta be able to handle that. So, but these cameras are getting, well, our cameras, I guess, are getting bigger and bigger. The housings are pretty massive and it's a lot of gear. My housing weighs about 60 pounds dry. It's perfectly neutral in the water and it's easy to handle, but something that big is hard to maneuver if you're in a current. Um, and then, of course, there's the GoPro side of things, so, you know, it can go that direction. Um, but for me, I just learned a lot from other photographers, and I travel a lot with some really high end pros. Um, and I've just kind of learned while doing it and put my, put my best efforts out there about a year ago on a, on a reel and got some recognition um, in some festivals. And, you know, it's kind of what you do. You just sort of work your way through. I, I think it's interesting that, that everybody, I think all four of us, uh, and probably a lot of you there, we're here, we did this pursuing our passion, a passion that we had for... for film for motion picture, for stills, for underwater, combining several passions. And I think that's probably the biggest key that gets you in the door and gets you moving is that drive to succeed in something that you really enjoy. And <clears throat> pardon me, um, just having that and being able to 
be persistent and pers persevere through all the ups and downs. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting because I fell into the IMAX gig very much the same way. I was, I was working for a production company that did underwater photography and some crazy old guy about looked like me, kind of gray haired, came to us one day with this big ass camera and wanted to take it underwater. And uh, he happened to be the co-founder of IMAX and I, like these guys, I worked with him, I still work with him now, you know, 38, 40 years later. Uh, so it's, it's finding, finding the niche that you like and uh, working through all the obstacles that get in your way. So we kind of started talking about it a little bit. Um, I want to delve into kind of the technology side um, of what you guys do. You're in these crazy places underwater, um, mountaintops, um, and the advantage you guys have is you started with film. Like everything, film's unfortunately disappearing, and um, the technology is changing almost daily as far as the size of the cameras, heating issues, cold issues, um, and all these extreme environments you're in. So how has the changing technology affected the way you guys do your job and what are some of the things you can look forward to about it? Um, I think um, for underwater, I, I mean, the biggest issue we deal with, I think, is heat, uh, especially when you're putting the cameras inside of a housing. And then if you're, uh, you know, you have to watch out for, you know, depending on your water temperature and things like that, you can get condensation inside, especially, you know, like, uh, you know, certain cameras will really heat up. I've had uh, cameras shut down in the middle of a, a shot because it overheated, and that's kind of a frustration. Um, dealing with sensor sizes, I think sometimes um, for me it's it's an issue, you know, because you have to sometimes rethink. Especially, I've shot some high speed underwater. The the, the director goes, "Oh, we want to want the uh, actress to look really slow and ethereal," and I'm like, "Well, they're already slow and ethereal in the water to begin with. You don't really need to go 200 frames per second to do that." But they want it, and then you have to deal with, you know, you're not using the entire sensor now. You'd start dealing with sensor factors and things like that. So I remember on this one job, I, I tend to like to use wide angle lenses. And we were on a, I told the, guy, the director of photography, I said, I, you know, preferably, you know, like an 18, but with the frame rate, I felt like I was on a 50 millimeter lens. It was just so long for what we were doing. And, uh, you know, I said, do we really need to go that fast? But so you have a lot, and there's, you know, standardization, I think, is another issue that we deal with. You know, you can deal with an Epic, you can deal with an Alexa, you can deal with the 5D, which is what I get thrown at in my job, uh, or GoPro, whatever the case may be. And sometimes, you know, it's a little, each system is a little bit different, has its own little nuances, known color spectrum, whatever the case may be. But shooting film, you always knew that, you know, I'm shooting this stock and it's going to react this way in this condition. You kind of get used to knowing what the film stock's going to do. But when you kind of change around to all the different digital cameras, sometimes it, uh, it's an issue. You know, you deal with that. And then, of course, you deal with all different lenses. And certain housings will accept certain lenses and certain housings won't. You know, uh, I've deal, you know, I shoot with oil. I've shot with anamorphic lenses. I tend to like to use prime lenses, but every now and again I get DPs who really, um, they might be good lighting DPs, but they don't lo know focal lengths really well. So they wanna, they'll, they'll call me up and they'll say, well, can we use a short zoom in that housing? And I'm like, yeah, you can, but you really, but then you get down there and then some of the housings I use are remotely run. And one of the most frustrating things is they'll tell you to push in on a shot, and then the next thing you know, I'm swimming in, and then the DP decides he wants to zoom in. So you get into this yo-yo effect. It's like, geez, you know, and so it becomes an issue there. So I tend to like to have, you know, the prime if I can force them into it. But yeah, a lot it's of people hard, don't. Yeah. You know, to change lenses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't change underwater, so you got to come it's up. Hard to, yeah. hard to change lenses in space, too. Uh, yeah, so. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I mean, most of the lenses you can change pretty quickly because the ports come right. I mean, the housing systems I use, the ports come right off. It's just a matter of just popping it off, putting it back on, you yeah. know, on the surface. But. I think the technology is um, with the digital has allowed, on a positive note, has allowed DPs to light from the eye and from the hip. Yeah. Um, 
at the same time, what I what usually happens, winds up with me is I'll start the day using my light meter to balance out the set lighting-wise and stuff. And then once I kind of get a feel for what it looks like, then it's not too often I'll bring my light meter out. I kind of get a feel. The gaffer knows what we're doing. We kind of have a ratio set up. Um, still bring out the meter to check things, but it really is lighting from the hip, lighting from the eye, lighting from the gut, which is nice. The negative side is everybody else on the set starts lighting from the gut and telling you what you're doing wrong. And everybody from the guy who's an, you know, an amateur Photoshop guy to a, someone who's a skilled technician. Um, you know, I, I was on a commercial shoot one time where the ad agency creative told me that the uh, image looked too bright and that I should stop down. And I reminded him that he was looking at a consumer grade monitor and he still wouldn't take my heed my advice, so then I brought him over to the waveform and vector, which totally confused his mind, and I set him at ease. Um, my job is to deliver a solid negative. Um, it's still, you know, that, that whole negative side of it is that anybody who can afford to buy a camera becomes a cinematographer, and there's very little difference between good and bad. The reality is the good people rise to the top, and there's always, you know, a, a certain group of people who will always kind of meander in the middle. Um, but you see it right away in someone's work, and you see the quality rise up, whether we're shooting on digital, whether we're shooting on film. Um, and we know how to use the technology. Um, and now we're back to a point, for a while there, we were being told what cameras to shoot with. The camera would be hired before we would. We're seeing it come full circle now where they will ask you, what camera do you want to use? Um, or they'll tell you, hey, we're going to shoot this on this camera. And you can now make intelligent decisions and say, you know what, that's a good camera, but this one will give you the best flesh tones. Or this one will give us the most freedom to shoot, a little bit of, over, you know, a little bit of high speed, a little bit of green screen, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They all have their place. Um, so it's, it's interesting how it pushed us, it pushed everything away from cinematographers and now luckily it is starting to come back. It's, it's, it's interesting that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the Hollywood cinematographers now are, are choosing, choosing the camera like they used to choose a film stock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're basically choosing the camera for its look right. rather than, than for how it works or what brand name it has on it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, right. it's what the sensor actually does. Uh, but it's it's interesting the whole evolution of digital scene I, to me and and I've heard other people say this is probably been the most disrupting transition in the history of film, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's still in the process. I mean I am constantly every day I I'm in production pre-production on a couple of films right now. Uh, one of them we will be combining digital images with uh, IMAX standard film images, and they have to blend as seamlessly as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's a bloody tall order. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, and and post... you, guys, you guys are on the, you know, the, riding the crest of this wave. So, yeah. so the whole post workflow has oh, changed. Gosh. Don't even talk so, post. So, <laughs> I mean, but, um, yeah, I mean, you really have to work it yeah. to get the yeah, images absolutely. to pop if you're looking at something raw, like out of the red. And, and you, have you, to, know, you have to follow it through the whole chain. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're now, because in our, our next space movie, because we no longer have a space shuttle, uh, we can't bring 10-pound rolls of film back from space. So we have to shoot digitally in space. So now we're shooting on, on uh, codecs, we'll shoot on codex recorders, mm -hmm. and fly something the size of an iPhone back rather than a 10-pound, 20, 30 pounds of film. Uh, so... Yeah, the interesting thing and, with and, that is, back in the... Well, back probably up into the early 90s of IMAX, they wouldn't even release a film on video. No, it, they it never was, went out it on was video. film only, IMAX, which is uh, 65 millimeter, 15 perfs. Yeah. It's almost like a two by three negative, it's huge. They wouldn't touch it. And then there was this big transition, probably about the mid 90s, yes. where they all of a sudden said, We don't care what you shoot it on as long yeah. as we can release it. Right. Which was disappointing for those of us who were oh, purists yeah. about yeah. the format. Yeah. Right. The, the other thing I find, think, with, with with digital is is maintaining the the sense of craft with when shooting it maintaining the sense of economics that we tried to do when we were shooting film you know rather than going the the shotgun method with eight cameras and roll for everything and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that's 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 the other post flow that is a pain in the butt right <laughs> that's <laughs> why we don't work in footage. Post. exactly <laughs>
So um, we are, we're at extreme filmmaking. So uh, if you guys could just give us a quick story of kind of the most like crazy, extreme, fun, unique, interesting story parable you have about shooting. I hope that made sense. I rambled a little bit. Hmm. I don't know. I guess apart from being up here today. <laughs> I've, I've, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, usually underwater, when they hear you underwater, the first thing everybody asks me is about sharks. You know, what's it like to film sharks? And, you know, they go, oh, are you in the cage? And things like that. And, and usually when I film sharks, I'm never in the cage unless I'm shooting a POV shot, you know, from talent's, you know, perspective. But generally I'm out in the middle of, you know, the water column with, I've had 30, 40, you know, sharks all around me, bumping me, swimming, you know, between my legs and things like that. So I guess, you know, maybe that's extreme. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, Could seem so to some people. Know, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, extreme is relative. Yeah. Yeah. I, had, I, had asked, um, I had asked, what do you mean by extreme prior to coming in here? And uh, he threw the question back at me, what do you think extreme is? Um, my perspective is I've done the extreme of, you know, working at uh, 10,000 feet with an IMAX camera trying to shoot ski footage at night to being on stage shooting uh, Shaquille O'Neal on a green screen with 350,000 watts of light. Mm -hmm. um, or recently we just shot actually over in Sarasota a football player on a stage where we put down 50 by 50 feet of grass and actually had real rain with burning about 150,000 watts of light. Extreme is relative. Mm -hmm. um, the key to any type of extreme filmmaking is to not as, and I was explaining a story where I was working on a, on a ski film shoot where the director insisted on us putting the camera in weird positions in crazy places because it looked really good for the behind the scenes. Um, our goal first and foremost as cameramen and cinematographers is to make sure everybody that left in the morning comes home at night all in one piece. It's about safety. It's not about us being extreme even though we're shooting extreme. Uh, safety is probably the biggest key in it all. And mm -hmm. it's not about us looking cool, it's about us getting great images and what it takes to get great images. So that to me is a big part of, uh, I actually know one of, the, I met one of the guys who worked on uh, Deadliest Catch. All right. And he was a single man cameraman on the boat who ran five cameras and worked around the clock. He was paid about $1,400 a day. I told them they'd need to pay me about 150000 a day <laughs> exactly. to even be there. That that, is the, that's extreme. That's yes. the ultimate that's extreme. Money, not, only, yes. not only is it extreme filmmaking, but it's extremely stupid <laughs> and extremely underpaid <laughs> right. for the risk he's taking for right. Discovery Channel. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to you gear it. I mean, if you want to get into sort of extreme style it's, filmmaking, understand that it's not your job to be in the dangerous position. It's yeah. the people in front of the camera. And then again, it's your job to make sure the people in front of the camera are safe. Because yeah. you also want those people to go home safe as well. That's, that's a good point, because I, I, I know of at least two or three cameramen who have died in the process of, of shooting. You know, mm -hmm. it's, they, they push it beyond where they should have and, and pay the ultimate price for it. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, any film is not worth getting yourself killed on or killing somebody else. No. You know, There's always a safer way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll even tell a producer, you know, I, this, this can't be done. I mean, I've done, you know, car crashes into the water where they, you know, they launch them into the air, they come in, and then there's a big fireball where the entire surface of the water is on fire. And it's like, God forbid anything goes wrong because I'm not coming up, you know, surface-wise until that fire is put out. And, you know, in cold water, I've had, you know, extreme cold. Uh, extreme depths. I've, yeah. I've had, had to tell a uh, producer one time, I said, you keep this up, I'm going to be dead in like two days because we were doing deep saturation dives and it's like, I can't, I can't keep this up. I said, you got to give me two days off just to desaturate to, in order to do the next right. set of diving. So, you know, you got to do something. I mean, thankfully it was in Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Tough job. Yeah, they well, just had to have those extra two days off. Lounging right. on the beach, desaturating. Most people are saturating. Right. Yeah. Right. I was on a, uh, this was back when I was a camera assistant. We were on a music video shoot where we were on a condor looking straight down over two cars hitting head on. And both me and the key grip were in the basket. We asked the, the AD if there was any pyro involved in the shoot. And he said no. We asked the special effects technician if there was any pyro involved in the shoot. He said no. 
we're up in the basket looking down. I sh well, actually, before I even got, before I even got up, I look at the basket, and the key grip had lined it all with furniture pads for safety. And then we go up in the basket, and uh, right before we roll camera, the key grip looks at me and goes, why don't we hunker down? I'm like, eh, not a bad idea. These two cars hit. It was the loud exp loudest explosion I've ever heard in my life, and I've done a lot of pyro. I mean, a lot. We were apparently enveloped in a fireball that dissipated above us. People started screaming, are you guys okay? We pop our heads up, and there's glass raining down on us. Both windshields of the cars were wrapped with Primacord, but they didn't have a permit to use Primacord. So they told us it wasn't there. Um, to this day, that guy is my key group. <laughs> um, what none of us realized at the time, because literally we were all in shock, what we should have done is literally just pull out a cell phone and call 911 and report an explosion. It would have shut down the entire production because what they did could have caused people to die. And it's stupid. It, there's no reason for it. And one of the things about extreme filmmaking is you, you have a voice. Um, and speak it and come up with a game plan to make sure everybody's safe. Um, it's, it's very important. Well, and, exactly. and kind of on that note is, if you're in a situation where you're at risk or there's something that isn't safe or something that you don't think you should be doing, is there a proper channel or a proper way you should attack that and go about um, getting it to be made safe so you're not putting yourself or your team well, legally, at risk? Legally, no, it's the AD. Um, I don't know if Florida did it, but in California, they made us take these safety classes. California. Yeah. And what it makes is the AD is criminally responsible. Yeah. So if there's a scaffolding built and you go, hey, there's a, high, there's a high tension wire right above that scaffolding, this isn't legal. And the AD says, we're fine, and someone dies, they can go to jail for murder. Yeah. The yeah. AD is the top of the food chain above the director. The theory is the director is there for creativity. And you literally, you're not supposed to be interpreting or changing their lifestyle. The AD is responsible. The yeah. producer's responsible. I've, I've had an, an occasion in a foreign country where we had a foreign crew, and I went out to set, and they had the jib set up through a set of Highline wires. And I went to the, the, the production manager at, uh, who was on set, and I said, hey, we can't do this. You know, people die doing this. And he says, yeah. and it was actually my first AC who brought the... Oh, Freddie. Freddie, you know the story. Yeah, uh, I know it well. Freddie, Freddie came to me and he says, you know, we, somebody got killed in L.A. a couple of weeks ago doing this. Oh. We can't do this. And, yeah. and I went to the production manager and he says, well, what if I send Fred home and we do it anyway? I said, well, who's going to shoot your movie because I'll leave too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. You've got to stand up for that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up not doing it and yeah. found a better, another way, not a better way, but we found another way of making the shot. And, uh, yeah. On, on production jobs that I do, you know, in, uh, you know especially in underwater um, and you're in a tank situation, you know, they, they always have a, the safety meeting and they go through everything and especially, you know, with lights and, uh, you know, they always tell, make sure nobody plugs into anything because everything on, the, on a water set is all GFI'd so that, it, God forbid, anything happens, nobody gets zapped in the water. So, you know, they always make sure they're very pretty thorough for the most part. I haven't been in any situation that I felt really, really in trouble. I've had to talk to some producers, you know, hey, what you're doing is, is not safe at all. And they, well, again, I've been lucky that they've, you know, they listen to you. Because the minute, the minute you say, you know, maiming or deaf, <laughs> they get worried about that, so. Yeah, there's always enough time to do it right and do it safe. Um, if somebody's rushing it that much, chances are something bad's gonna happen. That's the reality. And ultimately, it's not your job to worry about the bottom line at the end of the day. It's, once again, your job to make sure your crew and everyone goes home happy and safe. Right. I mean, as a wildlife photographer, mostly recreational, you know, we have to make our own decisions about whether or not it's going to be safe to go in the water in those conditions mm -hmm. and, you know, what the... Um, you know, what the behavior of the animals might be and things like that. Yep. It's, it's also good to know uh, that you've talked to various scientists and marine biologists that will tell you, oh, these sharks are going to behave mm -hmm. a certain way or these stellar sea lions, they might come up yeah. and bug you a little bit, but just, mm -hmm. you know, stay calm or whatever. Yeah. You kind of, you have to do that if you're doing any kind of wildlife stuff, but you're really responsible for your own safety yeah. at that point. I was uh, hired to shoot still photography for a TV show of chimpanzees. 
Oh. And there's a guy in L.A., his name's Steve Martin, not the actor, but the animal trainer. And I went inside the pen with the chimps. And one, the first thing they warned me about, they said, if the chimps start to get frenetic, stay still. The first thing they go for is your genitalia. But don't worry, we'll protect you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they assured me that I would be fine, and I was, but uh, certainly it raises your, it heightens your level, and you just literally have to remind yourself over and over again, don't do anything rash. Yeah. These are professionals. And uh, this guy, Steve Martin, I mean, he's legendary for his work. And, you know, when you meet animal trainers, one thing that's nice, you look at their fingers, make sure they have all ten. <laughs> uh, look for scars upon their body. If you're dealing with someone who's got a lot of war wounds, you might be nervous. Just like pyrotechnicians, if they're missing fingers, you might want to be nervous. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the the chimpanzee story reminded us. It's another Fred story. We were shooting uh, chimpanzees in the wild in Tanzania, and and the, our our chimp Jane Goodall was our chimpanzee expert. Can't beat that. Uh, she says same thing. If if they come at you, be calm, be calm. Yeah. Well, Fred was so calm that one of them came up to him and grabbed him by the butt and threw him out into the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> And we went flying, and, wow. and the same chimp came after the director, and, and I think I was third on his list, but fortunately we wrapped before I got to dance with, with Frodo. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yeah. one of the things that uh, I like to go through with my students is being able to adjust to things quickly, um, be able to handle problems um, when they arise on set without losing your gourd and freaking out. Um, so I'm looking to you guys to kind of, once again, kind of a story about um, you know, a technical difficulty, the camera went down in the middle of the shot, like how did you react, what did you do to fix the problem, um, adverse weather, things like that. Just a, a quick little story about how something went horribly wrong, but you made it not so horrible. Uh, well, everybody's seen those, uh, the labels now that are keep calm. You know, right. There's so many uh, variables about that. But it is true, that's first and foremost, especially if you're the cinematographer on the set, because um, even though the AD has that legal responsibility and the director is sort of the uh, general on the field, you're sort of the backbone that's going to keep sort of everything together. And if you have a great relationship with your AD, that helps. But keeping calm is number one. Understanding the technology you're dealing with is fantastic. Having an assistant who knows what they're doing and covering them. Um, recently we were shooting, I mean, it's a very simple situation. We're shooting with a uh, C500 with the uh, Codex recorder on a very hot day in LA and the whole thing went down. And um, so I had to do a, a redirect away from my DIT who's sweating his head, head off in the hot sun trying to fix the unit. And basically me and the AD kind of grouped together and we're distracting the director while the camera's being fixed. So the director doesn't know that we're losing time and you let the producer know if it's a good producer, they'll be super cool about it. But there's, in my opinion, there's never any reason to panic about anything ever unless people are dying. Mm. Uh, but if it's a camera that's going down, there's always a way to fix it. There's always a backup contingency plan. We're professionals. Um, if you've got insurance, you're covered on that. But, uh, I mean, we've all had cameras go down. Sure. Everything from, you know, IMAX cameras are notorious for jamming. Yeah. Um, depending upon the weather. The funny thing is the only time our ca my Max camera didn't jam was when we were shooting in Barrow, Alaska, and it was minus 40 degrees. The camera ran perfectly. <laughs> um, on a stage where it's, you know, 80 degrees and perfect humidity, the camera would jam like crazy. Yeah. Uh, digital cameras, same thing. I mean, did a phantom shoot recently. Had a few dropout frames and yeah. happens. You know, it is what it is. You roll with it. I mean, it's not a perfect scenario. It's never a perfect technology, but that's why we as professionals get hired. Yeah. Because we know what the contingency plan is. We have one in place in the top of our head. And we lead the entire crew to calm everybody down. Yeah. And it helps, like in my case, I, I try to make sure, I mean, I've worked in the underwater world so long that I, you know, I'm comfortable with any housing that they give me. And uh, I, granted, I have an assistant camera opera, a cameraman that works with me. He does all the, the prep and everything like that. But I still know probably every inch of that housing and I can see if anything's going wrong. Uh, and I think that's really important if you're doing, you know, if you're going to be in a cinematography position, uh, it's a good idea to know your equipment pretty well. Because I, I remember a job I was on, I was, they had an uh, underwater camera on a, um, a hydro head and a jib arm. And I was a, the uh, handheld operator, but uh, they were just, at uh, that one point I was just out of the water and I was watching them do the, um, the jib arm, and I'm like looking at the 
the um, the monitor, and I, I just told the uh, the DP, I said, just get that camera out of the water right now, point the lens straight down. And uh, they did, and he says, what's wrong? I said, just get it out, you know, and it was a 435. <laughs> and uh, so they brought it out, and I, they popped open the, uh, the dome off the, and it just like, whoosh, all this yeah. water came in. And he goes, how'd you know that? I said, well, it was just fogging up. It was something, I could see something was wrong. And they didn't hire my assistant at that time. And um, they, they just looked at me, I was the expert, and they said, well, what happened? Well, wh why is this doing this? And I went down and I looked at it, I said, well, you, they forgot the O-ring. Oh. So, you know, yeah. a little 50 cent O-ring <clears throat> cost them, I don't know how many thousands of dollars because the camera got fried. They had to get another camera body and the lens got destroyed and everything like that. So it's a big cost to them. And uh, so the, uh, I told the producer, I said, you should have brought my assistant on because this never would have happened. And, you know, that's one of those things. You just need to know your gear, I think. Probably before the days of pulling a vacuum on the no, housing. It was, oh, it really? Was, but somehow it, it was a, a testament to the housing, to be honest with you, that the, it held, okay. held that long, but not long enough, uh -huh. you know, for the amount of time that they had in the, in the, uh, while they were setting up the shop. But, uh, no, we pull we pull the vacuum on it, and yeah. uh, it it, it uh, you know, but it again the guys didn't probably check it before I put it in too, you know, because we always like as soon as we pull a vacuum just before it goes in, we just give it a little push just to see it if it's again. got yeah. it, yeah. So um, we have we have space, we got underwater, high speed, all of these have very specific lighting situations. How do you know what you're getting into um, ahead of time so you can prepare for the types of lights that you're going to need? Um, and, you know, because if you're using just the sun, like how do you plan for those things? Um, if you're using whatever lights are built into your spaceship, I guess. Um, <laughs> so how do you, how do you prepare? How do you get ready for those things? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Well, fortunately, when, when you're shooting from space, you've got interiors and you've got exteriors. And exteriors, you've usually got sunlight, uh, unless you're on the dark, side, dark of the side of the Earth, you know. And if you're on the, the sunny side, you've got the sun, plus you've got the world's biggest bounce card, which is the world. Uh, so you've got really good, nice fill light. Uh, so typically, you're, you've just got a nice daylight exposure, unless you're really right at Terminator, where the sun stops shining. Um, inside is a little more difficult. It's, uh, we, we have flown little cool lamp things that, that get put in a cage and this and that, all sorts of different technology for, for lighting. Uh, and then just getting the astronauts to be able to put, it, put those lights in the right places so that they're not right into the lens. And, and uh, that, that's, that's the biggest challenge is, is just getting guys who are not used to making movies to make movies with 25 hours of training, so, you know. Yeah. And on, right. underwater for us, it's, it's, it's got to be motivated, too. You, you know, lights coming up from underneath are, you know, not really normal in, right. <laughs> in the underwater world. So a lot of it is, you know, you got the sunlight, and you might have, uh, you know, depending on the type. I know with the wildlife stuff, you know, I've got, you know, separate, you know, video lights sometimes, and I'll move them around a little bit uh, just to kind of kiss kiss whatever I'm trying to shoot. Um, I, don't, I don't like that round circular <laughs> light on an animal that says, oh, there's somebody there. You know, exactly. the whole point is you, you want to shoot wild animals as naturally as you possibly can. And then, uh, and then in uh, commercials and feature stuff, you know, it's all, it runs the gamut, but generally it's got to be motivated, the lighting and all that. I mean, I sure, I, learned what I know about lighting shooting stills and with big giant strobes I mean, you figure out after time how to mm -hmm. place the strobes and yeah. what looks natural and um, carrying that forward into the digital film process you can't get a light that's going to you know, blast the yeah. reef and get the amount of light that you can out of strobes so you have right. to figure out how to balance the ambient light with lights that you do have. Right. right. And I've taken 
even as many as four video yeah. lights on my housing. And to avoid the backscatter. And a avoid, lot, yeah. a lot of, you can right. tell some of these are rookie when they got, like we were talking, Jim and I were talking about earlier. The shot looks like it's shot in a snowstorm. A snowstorm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So when they, they front light something, you know, so badly, you can see every particle that's in the water column, you know. Right. And so, you know, you got to avoid that. Those, those are, you know, big critical no-nos. I mean, occasionally you can't help it. I mean, I remember shooting manta rays in Kona, and it was there's so much krill. So, I didn't know. I just you know other why than they're there because they're eating it. Yeah, yeah you right. Know, you, you had you know a lot of backscatter, but you know I, my my lights were so far apart. I was just just getting enough in there, and then of course with the digital you can pump up your eyes. And so, motion helps. You know motion yeah, helps move yeah, it. So correct, it's yeah. not just a static yeah, thing yeah. in the middle of the frame. Right. Right. But that's the biggest problem underwater is, you know, you got to avoid that backscatter because even in tank shoots, you know, as soon as they start putting staging in and anything else, because um, didn't you do stomp? Yeah. 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 I mean, when you put staging in, you, did you get a lot of schmutz in the water? So you have to watch that, you know, yeah. it's, it's a big issue, you know. Yeah. And I think for me, it's like I probably use the most extreme amount of light of anybody uh, shooting all the high speed stuff. and. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, once, once I was shooting uh, some elements for CSI, uh, some promos one time, and the producer asked me why I needed a 20K, actually two 20Ks to do the shoot. And I told him because I was shooting extreme high speed, and he, uh, he suggested, well, you know, the 10K cost half as much, and I told him, well, I need the 20K. You get half as much. Uh, <laughs> so we show up on the day, and we were doing multiple setups, and we went over to another part of the room to shoot this quick insert, and we grabbed the 10K and put it on the shot. And it wasn't enough, so we swapped it out for a 20K, and the producer looked at me, he goes, okay, now I get it. Um, other producers will say, you know, they'll look at my body of work, and they go, they trust me. They say, they, I know what I'm doing, so I'm not going to question you. Um, but lots of times, you know, people, they want to shoot high speed, but then they don't want to pay for everything that goes along with it. It's expensive. It's an expensive venture. There's no doubt about it. I mean, a 20K rents for 850 a day. And then if the globe goes, you're out what, five grand, I think, for 20K Globe. Um, the truth is, though, for me, if I'm shooting 24 frames per second, I would still key it with a 20K and diffuse the bejeevers out of it, because that's the way I like to light. I like the light to wrap. Um, when it comes to high speed, a lot of newbies, they'll just take, they'll tell you. I mean, I've had people tell me, what you need to do is take a big light and just blast it. No, you don't. You, I light whether I'm shooting 2,500 frames per second or 24 frames per second, I light it the same exact way, bigger, smaller heads. But it, to me, I want it to be seamless. Um, we did, I uh, shot LeBron James two years ago, and the directive that I was given was LeBron James is playing basketball in a gymnasium, and it looks like a normal day, and we're shooting at 1,000 frames per second. So we had to light the entire gymnasium for 1,000 frames. So we bought in two uh, soft suns, which are 100,000 watts each. And then we bought in uh, some 20, uh, about four or five 20Ks and a wall of 10Ks. And what was great about that is my gaffer and I came up with a lighting, you know, basically a lighting order. And we used every single light we ordered. Not one single one was turned off, and we didn't need any extra ones. We were so on the money because we've been doing it for so many years. And that just comes from experience. You know, you have your standard lighting package you show up with. And yeah, you can do it with, you can do it with 100 different lights. It's your aesthetic at the end of the day. One of the best advices, or not advices, but I should say a, a sort of um, point of view that a gaffer of mine that I worked with once, when I was lighting, I start with big lights pointing towards the lens, and he goes, yeah, you, you do it right. He goes, the, the best light starts towards the lens. And I never thought about it, but it does. I never fill my front until my edges are in, and then I'll bring up the front, but that's my aesthetic. I don't do music videos. <laughs> Backlight rocks. Yeah. yeah, it does. Backlight, yeah, look at uh, a few good men, right? <laughs> um, so, we're getting close to the end, so I just have uh, two questions for you. Two more questions. So we'll do one, then we'll do the other. Standard question procedure, I guess. Um, what's the most memorable thing you guys have gotten to do um, that keeps you wanting to continue doing this, that keeps you pushing to keep living your dream? Uh, I, anytime I'm in the water, I'm happy. You know, I've been pretty lucky. I've been able to, I've been around the world, I, I guess, 
some of the most memorable uh, projects is I worked on a project on dolphins and I got to swim in the Amazon River and swim with the pink dolphins there. That was pretty cool. Uh, I've, been, I've been fortunate enough to have swim with whales and dolphins and sharks, manatees. Um, you know, so anytime I'm shooting wildlife, I'm happy. Uh, and, then, and I've been able to cross over to the, you know, the Hollywood version. I've done TV shows, I've done, you know, features, commercials, music videos. So I've been very fortunate that being an underwater specialist, I can kind of cross all the lines, but wildlife has always been my first choice. Yeah, for me, it's, um, you know, when I look back on my life, you know, I think when I was 15 years old, I had a job picking corn. Um, once had a job working for an asphalt company, and because I wasn't one of the chosen ones, you know, I wasn't uh, like friends with the owner of the company, and everybody's like, this is your fate, this is where you'll wind up. Uh, looking back on moments like that where I'm like, damn, I'm lucky. Uh, talking to my brother who has a full-time job who hasn't had a vacation in two years. Um, that's part of, you know, that thing that drives you. And then to think how awesome is it that you get to travel around the world uh, you get to shoot some of the coolest, or photograph some of the coolest things, meet some of the most amazing people, and continue to be creative. This whole idea of a creative mind that we are, we have this insatiable appetite to create. I mean, my daughter now is 15 years old, and my kids are truly an inspiration to me. She has that drive to constantly create, and it's taken me 40-something years to realize that I have that too. That. I cannot stop creating things. And um, I may not be able to draw, but I can take pictures or I can just think, I can imagine. When the, I mean, to, to wrap that all up, the coolest thing in the world is I am paid to daydream. Literally, right. that is my job, to daydream, to just let go and come up with it, whatever crazy idea I can. And does it get better? I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, it keeps getting better. You know, that's. I mean, that's why we do what we do. I mean, you guys are getting paid doing what you love doing. And, you know, me coming from the, um, my past as a recording engineer and then working in post now, you know, I love doing that. And I love working with my clients. And, you know, you get some really great projects to be involved in. But then when I get to get away and do my wildlife photography, I mean, that's the best experience for me. I just keep wanting to do it. And traveling is obviously key. So whether it's in the Maldives or whether it's offshore in Bimini doing great hammerheads or, you know, Galapagos, wherever it is, it's, it's a new experience. And it's one that I repeat over and over and go to the Maldives three times and go to Papua New Guinea five times. And, you know, it just, it's what, why we do it. What they said. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would be repeating a lot of things I've heard just now. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, work with NASA and I've trained astronauts to shoot stuff in space and, and having them react and, and say, oh wow, what you taught us, we're able to bring back images now to share with the world and let the world know what it's like for us to travel in space. That's kind of cool. Um, and the travel is great. World, you know, I've been around the world several times. Uh, still plan to travel a lot more. But of recently, last five or six years, uh, being here, one of the things that has kept me going is when I connect with you, when I connect with a student. And uh, to see that spark, that clue bird land, when I, when I impart something that, that you might not have known or you might not have thought of in that particular way. That I think is almost as, probably just as rewarding as anything else that I've done. And I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up your skirts here. I'm not mean that. <laughs> all right. So the last question is the big one. It's the uh, biggest piece of advice you can leave for all these students watching today, watching online. What's the one thing that you would like them to know? I would just say be passionate about what you do. Be persistent. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> took my answer. <laughs> Don't give up. And, uh, you know, it's going to be, some people, it's a tough road. It's a tough business. Um, it's, it's not always necessarily going to be handed to you. 
but if you really, really want to do it, you'll, you'll find your way. I mean, everybody's path is different. So, um, you know, um, my path is different than these guys, and I'm grateful that I've crossed paths with them. But, uh, you know, just don't dwell on the negatives. Don't dwell on the whatever. It's uh, all wasted energy. You just do the best you can. Learn whatever your passion is and whatever that skill set is required to do it. Just get to be the best you can and go out there and just be positive and just enjoy the ride because, you know, it's, it's what drives you, I think, I hope. Yeah, I think it's I mean, tenacity is a common word I use. Um, endless drive to do what you want to do and do what you believe you can do and do what you want to do and do it to the best of your ability all the time. As soon as you start to cut corners or say, oh, you know, even though I want to do feature films, you know, I got, I, you know, I think doing reality would be the, the branch to that, but then everybody knows that the quality of reality is much lower than any feature film. Those are some hard decisions you have to make turning down jobs that don't fit your perspective on life and your perspective on how you want to be a filmmaker. And if reality is what you want to do, then great. Jump into that full force and make it better. No matter what you do, my dad used to have a philosophy. His philosophy about borrowing tools was if you borrow a tool, give it back better in better condition than it was given to you. Same thing, if you are given a job, raise the bar. Make it better. Um, you know, if I go to the LeBron James thing, the first time somebody shot it, I, I felt they lit it wrong. They lit with the wrong kind of lights and it didn't look good. And I came in and I changed the cameras and changed the lighting because I knew it would make it better. I was taking a huge risk, no one believed in me. Everybody's like, you sure, you sure, you sure? At the end of the day, I got a phone call from four of the people involved in production that said, oh my God, you raised the bar, it looks amazing. So you have to be confident that you can change it, believe in yourself, and never take second best. So um, <clears throat> I think that you all, by being here, have access to some of the best tools that our industry can provide. And learning how to use those tools and to be able to you know, be as proficient as you can using those tools, but then taking that out into the so-called real world, um, you know, you have to apply what you learn here to be able to, you know, work in the industry because there's a million people that want to be cinematographers or recording engineers or whatever. So what's going to make you stand out above the rest of the crowd, you know, the rest of the people? So learn as much as you can be as proficient as you can, learn everything about the equipment, even get into sideways technology. You know, if you don't know much about, you know, data management, learn about data management because cinematography now is all about data management and a big part of it. So, you know, even take the side trip and figure out what works for you and, and then apply yourselves because um, I've actually hired, <clears throat> in my company, I've hired full sale employees and, uh, for the most part, I think we get really good people that, that really want to work hard, but you occasionally get the ones that, you know, maybe don't, and I'm not saying singling out full sale, but even my own son, who doesn't really want to apply himself and work hard. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But I think that's the key, is being able to apply yourself and apply what you've learned here at Full Sail to, you know, to get out there and make a living doing what you want to do. I think they've covered most of it. Uh, passion, persistence, perseverance, going for what you believe in, uh, but make friends, enjoy life. Don't get yourself hurt. Don't get uh, so absorbed in this industry that you, you get burned out on it. Um, never, ever, ever stop learning. If you stop Absolutely. learning, you stop being inquisitive about what you're doing. It's like the data management thing, find the sideways things, whatever it takes to keep your interest going. Uh, never stop learning. If you, if you think you know this business, you probably want to get out of it because you're, you're not going to do well once you think you know everything about it. Uh, and, and just stick to your guns and, and keep, keep plugging. There's going to be highs, there's going to be lows. Hopefully there's more highs than lows, uh, but uh, 
fight your way through the lows and the highs will keep you going all the time. Thanks. Uh, so everyone, thanks, thanks for coming today. It's a great panel. I uh, really appreciate it. Lots of clapping. It's good, you guys. <laughs>